Good day everyone. This is KIG2002 Dynamics. In our last two lectures, we have covered the kinematics of particles. We determined the rectilinear and curvilinear motions of particles. In today's lectures, uh, we will start to look into the kinetics of particles. There are several uh, methods of principles uh, used to determine the kinetics of particles. Today, we'll be looking into uh, one of the principles, Newton's second law. Newton's first law and third laws of motions were used extensively in statics to study bodies at rest and the forces acting upon them. And we know that these two laws are also used in dynamics. In fact, they are sufficient for the study of the motions of bodies which have no accelerations. However, when the bodies are accelerated, here is referred to when the magnitude of the directions of their velocities changes, then it is necessary to use Newton's second laws of motions to relate the motions of body with the forces acting on it. It. So in today's topics, we will discuss Newton's second laws and apply it to the analysis of motions of particles. This is the outline of today's lectures. We'll start with the introductions of Newton's second laws. We will then look into Newton's second laws of motions which states that if the resultance of forces acting on a particle is not zero, the particles will have an acceleration proportional to the magnitude of the resultance and in the direction of this resultance force. Next, we will also look into uh, how Newton's second laws can be expressed in an alternative form relating to the rates of change of linear momentum with the resultants of the forces acting on that particles. We also look into the needs of consistent unit in the solutions of dynamics problems. Then we introduce the equations of motions where the Newton laws is applied to the solution of engineering problems. We can also express the problems or dynamic problems in terms of its dynamics equilibriums. And we also need to know how to come up with these uh, free body diagrams and kinetic diagrams in order to help us uh, to solve uh, dynamics problems. In the solutions of engineering problems, we can use either the rectangular components where we have uh, discussed in our previous lectures or tangential and normal components of the force and accelerations involved. This could include uh, the actual bodies where here is referring to as large as a car, rocket, or airplanes where it can be considered as a particles for the purpose of analysis of its motions as long as the effects of rotation of the bodies about its mass center can be neglected. Next, or finally, we will be looking into the emphasis on the motions of particle under a central force where we use or analyze the problems in terms of radius and transverse components. The accelerations in transverse and radius components that we have learned in last lectures can be applied in the solutions of engineering problems. Kinetics of particles. We have discussed earlier what is kinetics. So it's a study of the relationships uh, existing between the forces acting on the body, the mass of the body, and the motions of the bodies. 
We use kinetics to predict the motions caused by the given forces or determine the forces required to produce a given motions. As shown in the given images here, we use kinematics to study the motions of the wheelchairs, the swing in terms of its uh, positions, velocity and accelerations. Whereas in kinetics, we include the forces acting on these bodies, the wheelchair and the swing. We analyze all the forces acting on the wheelchair in order to design a good ramps. Uh, whereas in the swing itself, high swing velocity can result in large force on the swing chains or ropes, causing it to break. So it is good to analyze also the force acting on these swings in order to produce the motions. So here we can determine what forces are required to produce these given motions uh, or safe motions. In Newton's second laws of motions, it stated that if the resultant force acting on a particle is not zero, the particle will have accelerations proportional to the magnitude of the resultant force and in the direction of this resultant force. When a particle of mass m is acted upon by a force f, the accelerations of the particle must satisfy the equations f equals to ma, f equals to ma. And these accelerations must be evaluated with respect to the Newtonian frames of reference. So what it means here is a frames that is not accelerating or rotating. Consider a particle subjected to a constant forces. So if we have three different forces, F1, F2, and F3, it will give us a difference uh, what we call the accelerations a1, a2, and a3. So if we have the ratios of f1 over a1, we know that it will be equals to f2 over a2 on the same uh, particles equals to f3 over a3, and they are constant values. And this constant value is actually is our mass m. If a force acting on the particle is zero, the particle will not accelerate. So it will remain stationary or continue on a straight line at constant velocities. When a particle is subjected to a simultaneous list of several forces, then the equation F equal to MA will become summation of F equal to MA, where the summation F represents the sum or resultants of all the forces acting on the particles. Newton's second law of motion can be expressed in another uh, forms in terms of linear momentums of a particle's forms. So if we replace the accelerations by the derivative of the velocities, summation F equals to ma now becomes summation F equal to m dv dt. Rearrange it, we can also uh, get uh, dmv dt. And this mv is equals to L, which is our linear momentums of the particles. So summation F will become to the dl dt, or we are saying that the resultance of the force acting on the particles is equal to the rate of change of a linear momentum of the particles. dl dt, or we can say it equals to L dot, is the rate of change of the linear momentum of the particles. If the rate of change of the linear momentum mv is zero, when summation f equal to zero, then we can say that the resultant force acting on a particle is zero, 
the linear momentum of the particle remains constant in both uh, magnitude and directions. And this is what we call the principle of conservation of linear momentums. We would also want to ensure that the system of view needs used in the solutions of engineering problems that involve kinetics, particularly using a Newton's second law, is consistent. There are four primary dimensions, the force, mass, length, and time. Three may be chosen arbitrarily. The fourth must be compatible with these Newton's second laws. If F equal to MA is satisfied, then the units are then said to be in the form of a system of consistent kinetics units. Two systems of consistent kinetics units are currently used by American engineers, the SI units and also the US customary units. So in SI units, the base unit are the units of length, mass, time in terms of m, kg and second, and the unit of force is derived in terms of newtons. So 1 newton equals to 1 kg meter per second square. In US customary units, the base units are the units of force in pound, length in uh, foot, ft, sorry for the mistake here, and time in seconds. The unit of mass is then derived in terms of pound mass. One pound mass equals to one pound force over 32.2 feet per second square. Another way of expressions, one slug equals to one pound force over one foot per second square. We recall the Newton's second law which can be expressed by the equation summation of F equal to MA. It relates the force acting on the particles and the vectors MA. In order to solve problem involving motions of the particles, it will be found more convenient to replace this equation summation F equal to MA by equivalent equation involving scalar quantities. We can resolve each force F and the accelerations A into rectangular components. It can be written as summation of Fx i plus Fyj plus Fzk equals to m. Here we have the Axi plus Ayj plus Azk. Here we have summation of fx equal to max, summation of fy equal to may in the y directions or components, summation of fz in, equals to maz in the z direction of components. And recall that the components of the accelerations are equal to the second derivative of the coordinates of the particles. So we have summation of fx equal to mx double dots. Summation of Fy equals to My double dots. Summation of Fz equal to Mz double dots. Recall what we have learned in our previous lectures on the motions of our projectiles. If the resistance of the air is neglected, the only force acting on the projectiles after it has been fired is its weight, W. So in this case, uh, we have W equals to negative W, J. The equations defining the motion of projectile are therefore we have our m x double dot equals to zero. M y double dot will be equals to our negative W, the weight, and m z double dot equals to zero again. And again, the components of the accelerations of the projectiles, as we have discussed here, our x double dot is 0, y double dot will be equals to the width, 
over the mass equals to negative g, which is our gravitational uh, accelerations, uh, 9.81 m over s squared. Our z double dot will be equals to zero. These equations obtained can be also integrated independently to obtain the velocities and the displacement of the projectile at any instance. We can make use of uh, this uh, Newton's second law equation of motions to solve uh, the kinetics problems uh, that related to the motions of projectiles. We can rewrite the Newton's second law in the alternative forms by transposing the right-hand members to the left. So here we have summations of f minus m a equal to zero. We add the vector minus m a to the forces acting on the particle summation f, and we obtain a system of vectors equivalent to zero. And this vector negative m a with the magnitude m a and the directions opposite to that accelerations is called an inertial vectors. So negative m a vector is inertial vectors. The particles may thus be considered to be equilibriums under the given forces and the inertial vectors. If the inclusions of the inertial vectors, this negative f and a, the system of forces acting on the particles of this is equivalent to zero. And here we can say that the particle is in dynamic equilibrium. Those methods that develop for particles in statics equilibrium may be applied. For example, coplanar forces may be represented with a closed vector polygons. Inertial vectors are often called inertial forces as they measure the resistance that particles offer to change in motions. Here it's referring to change in speed or directions. These inertial forces may be conceptually useful but are not like the contacts and the gravitational forces found in statics. Next, the free body diagrams and the kinetic diagrams. In order to solve dynamics problems, it's similar to what we have learned in statics. We have to know how to first uh, come up with this free body diagram or FBD. So the free body diagram is the same as what we have done in statics. But for dynamics, uh, we will need to add the kinetic diagram for our dynamic analysis. Let's take this uh, pulley system as our examples. Uh, we have a 15 kg mass being pulled through the pulleys by a force of uh, 2 to 5 newtons and it is with the inclined angles of 25 degrees. So what we need to do first will be the isolating the body of interest, the free body itself. So here is the blocks. Then we have to draw our axis of system, whether you are in Cartesian or polar or path. So here we assume our x is going this way, y is in these directions. Next, we add in the applied forces. Here we have the weights, mg. We have the pulling force. Okay, on these directions or x directions, 225 newtons. Alright. We can then replace supports with forces. For example, the normal force. So here we have the normal force 
as well as the friction force. Then we draw the appropriate dimensions, usually the angles for the particles. So here we have the 25 degrees. So with this uh, free body diagram itself, then we can next put the inertia terms for the bodies of interest on the kinetic diagrams. So with this completed free body diagram or FVDs, then that basically give us uh, summations of F, then we will need to put in the inertia terms of bodies all right equals to the accelerations of the particle times the mass so here we have max and may we have uh, decomposed in terms of uh, x and y in these directions x and y so we have max and may so that basically give us our ma so here we have this is our free body diagrams followed by the kinetic diagram and that basically give us summation of f equals to ma In our previous lectures on kinematics of particles, we understand that the acceleration can be decomposed in rectangular components, normal and tangential components, as well as radials and transverse components. Right? So in kinetics of particles, we can apply the same. Just now we have demonstrated how to decompose or resolve the forces as well as the accelerations in rectangular components. So now we want to look at how we can resolve it in terms of normal and tangential components. This is particularly important when one wants to determine uh, the forces applied on the particles. Let's see these two examples, the aircraft and the roller coasters. In kinematics, we study the kinematics motions in terms of the positions, uh, the velocities, and the accelerations of these uh, part particles. In this example, it's the aircraft and also the roller coaster at any time instance without uh, considering or without uh, uh, including uh, the force acting on these particles but in kinetics where the force coming in and when the forces matters then we would want to know how much forces uh, acting on the particles in this case is the aircraft and the roller coasters and when they are making a turns how much forces they are experiencing so these are all the topics of interest uh, in the kinetics of uh, particles. So we start with the equation of motions, the Newton second laws, taking the summation of F equals to MA. So this A, the acceleration vector, we can resolve uh, in terms of the tangentials and normal accelerations. Then our force itself also can be resolved in terms of tangentials and uh, normal components. So we have summation of Ft equals to Mat, summation of Fn equals to Man. When we say it, uh, tangentials then it will be referred to the tangent to the path in the directions of the motions 
and when we said the normal direction of component is towards the inside of the path. Recall what we have uh, determined in the kinematics uh, lectures. The tangential accelerations can be written as uh, dv dt, and the normal accelerations can be uh, written as uh, v square over rho, where the rho is the radius of the curvatures. So we have summations of fn equals to man, summations of ft in tangential component equals to mat. And please take note that the tangential components is tangent to the path. The normal component is toward the inside of the path. We also discuss in our kinematics lectures the acceleration vector can also be uh, decomposed in terms of uh, radius and transverse uh, components. This is particularly important when we are dealing with problem with both radius r and the angles theta are a known functions of time t. So in kinetics of particles we can also decompose our Newton's second law in the radius and transverse coordinates of components. Uh, systems like hydraulic actuators and the extending robotic arms are often analyzed using these uh, radius and transverse coordinates, where we will want to know uh, how the forces interacts or how the forces acting on these particular components or these particular systems that give them that particular or specific motions. And these uh, hydraulic actuators and ascending robotics, as you can observe that uh, these radius are changing over times. And the theta uh, is can be also changing over time, and it's very convenient if we can analyze or resolve the problems in terms of radius and transverse coordinates. So taking our Newton's second law summations of f equals to m a, then our force we can uh, resolve in terms of uh, radius and the transverse coordinates. In the polar coordinates, we have the r and theta. So the force, we have the summation of fr and summation of f theta. All right, summation of fr along the radius and in the theta. The angles or the transverse components we have summation of f theta and summation of fr is equal to mar where this ar is the radius uh, accelerations and we have learned before this ar or the acceleration in radius component is equal to r double dot minus r theta dot square whereas for summation of f theta we have the ma theta and this a theta itself is equals to r theta double dot plus 2 r dot theta dot. So, in short, we can say that we can decompose our uh, Newton's second law equation of motions in terms of here is radius and transverse coordinates or what we call polar coordinates in terms of r and theta so that give us summation of f r equals to m a r summation of f theta equals to m a theta besides radial and transverse coordinates we can also 
resolve it in terms of uh, tangentials and normal coordinates that we have discussed earlier and also the rectangular uh, uh, coordinates we have this fx fy fz equals to max may maz respectively so it depends on what type of problem we are analyzing and solving uh, if we are dealing with uh, those projectiles types of questions then rectangular component will be uh, more convenient if we are dealing with uh, systems that the radius and the angle changings over time then transverse and also the radial coordinates uh, will be more convenient finally if we are dealing with uh, problems that uh, related to a circular path where the radius of the curvature is given or known for example in the case of roller coasters in the case of uh, trains the aircraft turns then uh, probably uh, the forces and the accelerations can be resolved in uh, tangential and normal coordinates and it will be more suitable to solve this type of problems